Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening and welcome to Science for the Public and the Public Science Lectures. Um, tonight we're going to talk about ocean ecology and it has been a big favorite subject probably since Charles Darwin wrote the first one of the first monographs on coral reefs and people became very fascinated by this but today the public attention is directed not just at the beauty of coral reefs and the ocean life in general but at the vital role that coral reefs, for instance, play in preserving the health of the ocean. Coral reefs have been called the rainforests of the sea, and although they comprise very little of the ocean life themselves, about 1%, maybe less, they are home for about 25% of ocean species and vitally important for maintaining the biodiversity within the sea, as we'll see tonight. That's not a trivial issue, that's really crucial. Our guest tonight, Dr. Les Kaufman, is an expert and veteran researcher on ocean ecology and uh, also on coral reefs. His presentation is Eye to Eye with Climate Change in the Ocean, Coral Reefs to Cape Cod. He brings extensive international experience in ocean ecology and also brings recent news directly from the field. Dr. Kaufman received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University in 1980, later joined the biology faculty at Boston University. Today, he is professor of biology in Boston University's kind of exemplary marine program bio, uh, in the biology marine program, one of the best, one of the most outstanding of these interdisciplinary programs, and I hope he'll explain, if he has time, a little bit about it in this one in marine bi biology. He's also Senior Marine Scientist for Conservation, uh, Conservation International and a research scholar at the New England Aquarium. In addition to a very long list of technical publications, Dr. Kaufman has co-authored and contributed to books for a more general public, and this is a very welcome thing. One of these, The Last Extinction, co-authored with Kenneth Mallory, is an absolutely must-read set of essays uh, anticipating the ecological crisis in which we find ourselves today. This and the other books he's written, and including some children's titles uh, on uh, the oceans, uh, they, he, these uh, titles uh, are listed on our website and when this program is uploaded to WGBH there will be an Amazon link for uh, some of these titles as well. Dr. Kaufman has worked for decades to prove sci improve scientific understanding of the devastating effect of climate change on ocean biosystems and on the understanding of these biosystems. Today, you are aware that these biosystems are very much threatened by a great deal of our own human activity. Dr. Kaufman, though, didn't stop with just analyzing the problem. He has invested his expertise in the development of very innovative programs to restore these ecosystems as well. For this latter work, he received the 2009 Partners in Conversa uh, Conservation Award from the uh, Department of Interior for work he did in the Gulf of Mexico. We are very, very honored to have Dr. Kaufman with us tonight, not only to give us a better understanding of what's happening in the ocean, but to present these possible solutions to our problems. A very warm welcome for Dr. Kaufman. Well. Thanks, you, Don. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in Cambridge's beautiful new library 
which was a construction site for the last, what, five years or something like that. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, my purpose tonight is not to convince you that climate change is happening. Climate change has always been happening. I'm also not here to convince you that the rate of climate change currently is being caused by people. That's an empirical observation uh, supported by overwhelming amounts of data. Uh, and it's almost on par with the demonstration that evolution happens. So it's not a belief issue. It's just whether you are familiar with the evidence and you happen to be persuaded or not that it's being caused by people, I am. Um, what I'd like to focus on more is how we solve, how we address, survive climate change. And uh, my major point will be, I may as well tell you now in case you have to leave early, my major point is that there are things we should have been doing all along anyway in our own best interest, and those are the same things we need to do to adapt to the effects of climate change in the ocean. Now, people think of climate change as global warming, and that's unfortunate. Uh, A, because warming only refers to an average warming of the entire Earth. It doesn't get across the point that it's a redistribution of heat. So that some places get very hot and very dry. Other places have enormously greater precipitation. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of different bizarre and idiosyncratic effects that come from kicking the planet really hard. But we can isolate four particularly uh, uh, conspicuous effects that are manifested on local scales. One is extreme warming of restricted bodies of water, like the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean Sea. Uh, so the average warming of the Earth might be four degrees over several decades or centuries. Uh, in, the Car in one place like the Caribbean, it might be 11 degrees centigrade higher, which is just extraordinary and capable of powering immensely powerful storms like Hurricane Katrina. Consequently, in addition to this average warming and regional, more intensive warming, we are seeing increasingly violent uh, cyclonic storms. We call them hurricanes. They're also known as typhoons or cyclones. In addition, sea level is going up. Uh, not that noticeably in a person's lifetime, but enough to make a difference. And we'll see why in a moment. And the, er the Earth's ocean is becoming more acidic. Uh, and the carbon, uh, calcium carbonate that marine organisms make their skeletons out of is getting harder and harder for them to produce. So we're going to come back to this point in a, little, in a little while. But let's just think about each of these effects independently, make sure we understand them, and then see what we can do about it. Um, sea level rise is, the, is one, of the most, one of the ones you hear the most about. Obviously, water level goes up. It submerges coastal marine habitats. They become too deep. Things like coral reefs and kelp beds require sunlight. Uh, sun doesn't go through that much seawater. And if they find themselves just a meter or two deeper, they may die, or they may have to shift inshore to find shallow water again. Uh, when you increase uh, sea level, and you also have the combined effect of increased intensity of storms, the, the water becomes more opaque. There's a lot more sediment in the water, and this too makes it hard for marine plant life and corals to survive. Uh, one of the most amazing things, though, is you move fresh and salt water around. And you may not realize this, but fishes like salmon and striped bass and herring that swim up rivers to spawn are acutely tuned to, this, to where exactly on the river you go from fresh to salt water. And if that shifts too far up or downstream, the baby fish from the eggs that are laid there will hatch and they will find themselves in an environment devoid of food. They'll either be too far upstream from the food or too far downstream from the food. They have only a few hours to find the food. You can have total fishery failure because of a reworking of the space and timing of, the, of these events in early spring. And of course, we drown stuff. Hollywood showed us good examples of that in several movies, buildings underwater. But that would take a long time. The more subtle effects of sea level rise uh, have to do with changes in ocean currents. These are pictures of uh, Greenland and, and its ice cap. And this, can we turn down these lights up here? This, uh, this is an illustration from Hal Wanless in Florida, who's kind of a climate change impact hero. And the darker blue 
are places where the glaciers are uh, melting very quickly. Uh, so there's a lot of water, fresh water, flowing into the North Atlantic Ocean, and that water pushes the Gulf Stream south. If it happens, if it pushes it enough, the Gulf Stream will miss southwest England. As soon as that happens, England will be plunged into a mini ice age. This is probably the most immediate and most likely profound change due to a change in the distribution of fresh water. Of course, thanks. As, of course, as sea level goes up, uh, coastal areas that are low-lying will be inundated. This is Florida, as it might look in a couple hundred years. I just bought property. Uh, <laughs> I made sure I was in the brown. <laughs> uh, I would like my son to enjoy. He'll, actually, it wasn't waterfront, but it will be. So the value will appreciate significantly. OK, so one of the most amazing things that's happened is uh, in South Florida, there's this area called the Cape Sable area. This is Cape Sable. This is all Everglades. And uh, in the early 20th century, this was all freshwater Everglades with sawgrass. And in this short time, just 70 years, it's all turned into, I don't think you see under the bright lights, but it's all turned into mangroves. Now, is this good or bad? Well, if you like orchids and alligators, it's a bummer. If you like crocodiles and great white heron, this is super. So the value judgments that we attach to these changes uh, are plastic. I mean, it depends upon your feelings about stuff. But if you look at it more carefully, most of the species inhabiting the freshwater Everglades are unique to this area, at least their habitat associations, whereas the marine species, are more, or many of them, are more widely distributed. So there are consequences to the shifting of abundant and rare species due to this profound change in habitat. The other thing that happens with sea level rise is very rapid erosion. These are infilling, these are mud flats that formed over these uh, 50 years or so. Uh, totally changing the aspect of embayments in Florida. And uh, this accumulation of mud is very rapid. It's as much as like four inches in half a year. And here are guys walking around up to their knees in mud where when they started the study, you could see their shoes. So this is pretty profound. Now it has knock-on effects, as we call them. It has secondary effects. We lose freshwater glade wildlife and plant habitats. You know the tree islands in the Everglades? They're called hammocks. They become more isolated, and that will have ecological and evolutionary impacts. Exotic species like the Burmese python, you know this guy? They're the third largest snake in the world. Once you're up to the top three, it's kind of academic which one you're talking about. I mean, these are like 15 to 18 foot long snakes, uh, this big around, that eat full grown alligators. Uh, so it's really not good that they're there. But they will, they will prosper with sea level rise because it increases the amount of habitat that they can occupy, as will this uh, giant grouper, a goliath grouper, an endangered species which will actually do better as South Florida is inundated because it requires mangroves for its first few years of life. So warming is another of the distinctive aspects of uh, climate change, and it has the most severe and immediate impacts on the ocean. Uh, there's a process called bleaching. Many marine organisms have these tiny algae in their tissues in a symbiotic relationship. Corals, most famously, these are coral polyps, and you can see all the algae stuck in there. Uh, the algae are actually intracellular. In other words, within the cells of this anemone-like animal, uh, the the zooxanthellae, or algal cells, are encapsulated in membranes. And they're treated by the coral as if they were chloroplasts in a plant. And it's amazing, the molecular machinery of communication between the symbiont and the host essentially turns the coral animal functionally into a plant. So many of these corals will die without the algae. When the water temperature exceeds, in our part of the world, 30 degrees centigrade, for more than about five days, the coral can no longer provide enough oxygen to the algae, and the coral and the algae part ways. 
it's kind of a, it's kind of an amicable divorce because each one would kill the other immediately if it stayed. Now, um, if this goes on for a few days longer, this is a coral with its algae. Again, we might want to dim the lights a little bit. Uh, this is a coral with the algae. It looks brown. This is what happened when this coral bleached during a warm water event. It looks white. You can't tell it's alive, but there's this gooey tissue all over it. It's still alive. And given time, it could get its algae back. They're swimming around in the water, and they can get them back. They can also populate, repopulate their tissues with the few algae that are left. It's not just corals. There are giant clams. You know killer clams, like in Trader Vic's restaurant? Those are, those are meter-long clams that also farm algae in their tissues. There are tunicates, your kissing cousins, marine invertebrates that cover a lot of the sea bottom. They also have algae. Um, and a whole host of other animals are reliant on the symbiosis, and the symbiosis is turned off when the ocean gets too warm. The other thing is species that require a certain temperature range have to move north or south. They have to associate with new species they're not co-evolved with. Migration and linkages among habitats are disrupted, and as I'll demonstrate in a moment, the diseases of marine organisms are intensified by the shift in temperature. This is a little cartoon of algae leaving the polyp, and you can't see it, but each one has a little frown <laughs> on its face. All right. Rich Aronson, uh, a colleague of mine who normally works on coral reefs but wanted to get a little high adventure, began studying the Antarctic. And he's trained in paleontology, so he has a, a deep appreciation for how things have changed in the past. And based on that, he predicted that the spectacular communities of invertebrates in Antarctica, which look the way they do because there are very few predators feeding on these invertebrates. So it's like going back in time to a time before jaws were invented. Um, and these are just spectacular assemblages. They're part of what make Antarctica special. Well, the reason they can be there is because modern day crabs can't tolerate the cold. Rich predicted, before it happened, that the warming of ocean temperatures in Antarctica would open the door for invasion by these uh, recently evolved crabs and that they would devastate the Antarctic marine communities. And a few years after the prediction, it began to happen. It's, it's kind of like invaders from Mars. The other thing we've noticed, occurring very quickly during the 2000s, there was a rapid uptick in coral disease in one of our study areas in Brazil. In 2004, this coral, which is a living fossil, it's extinct everywhere in the world except Brazil, and in Brazil it's the primary builder of the coral reefs. It's called Musa smilia. Musa smilia was pristine before 2004, but beginning in that year we started to see these big dead blotches it turned out to be a bacterial disease that has been identified using modern molecular methods, and now 40% of the corals building the Brazilian coral reef are dying from this disease. The coral reef in Brazil contains a host of species that live nowhere else, not just this coral. We are witnessing, potentially, the end of coral reefs in the South Atlantic Basin, right in front of our eyes. Now, Global climate change also involves a change in extreme weather. This is a graph showing the number of hours that the water level, sea level, is anomalously high in Florida. Actually, this is Atlantic City. And uh, the 240 hours may not seem like a lot, but that's 10 days during the year that your house, your basement is flooded, or your first floor is underwater. So if that's ever happened to you, you know this is uncool. And what we're seeing is the change from 1910 to around 1995, the change in the number of hours that your house would be flooded. This is not good. And this is the result of a combination of sea level being higher, storm surges being greater because of the storms being more intense, and the winds being a higher velocity. And this is part of what contributed to the disaster in Louisiana. Now, some of the effects are very counterintuitive. For the last few years, colleagues and I have been studying the Galapagos as a kind of case study for climate change. And the reason for that is the Galapagos is one of the places where El Nino and La Nina, those, those climate, those natural climate patterns are most pronounced. And you can find very cold water right next to very warm water and study 
comparatively the system. Now, in 1983, though, the Galapagos was subjected to the worst El Nino on record. The water was so warm that most of the corals bleached and many of them died. So this is a graph for a particularly important coral showing the distribution of totally dead uh, and partly dead corals after that El Nino event. And the corals began to disappear from the coral reefs of the northern Galapagos. What came in, though, were these spectacular giant barnacles that Darwin was so fond of eating. They're about this big. They're like shrimp. If you smash them, you can pull the shrimpy thing out. And they can build reefs, too. So it's not that everything died. It's that there was a, there's a very strange transformation in the nature and character of all of the marine communities due to this event. But some things did disappear. The most abundant seaweed in the Galapagos, which only lives in the Galapagos, vanished. It's extinct. The most abundant fish that you could see in the daytime on several of the Galapagos Islands we have not seen in 30 years. It's probably extinct. We're talking about a fish that was there in the, in the hundreds of millions. So 45 species of marine organisms in the Galapagos are either missing in action or now on the verge of extinction, all because of the sequelae of this one unusually strong El Nino event. So El Nino is a natural phenomenon, but we now have evidence that its intensity may have been aggravated by uh, global climate changes. Now, one of the most puzzling of these marine impacts of climate change is called acidification. Now, at first, when I began working on this with colleagues at Biosphere 2, do you see that movie Biodome with uh, Polly Shore? It was like a spoof. OK, you're not going to believe this if you haven't heard the story. So these, this kind of cult, uh, which was funded by a rich guy named Ed Bass, uh, decided that they were going to prove that we could live on Mars. And they founded a company called uh, Space Biosphere Ventures, and the idea was to build a hermetically sealed world in the middle of the Arizona desert in Oracle, which at the time was just barely visible from Tucson. It was way out in the desert. Now it's in the middle of an old age home. Anyway, the idea was to build this four acre thing and really seal it up. And in it would be a rainforest and a desert biome and an agriculture. Do you guys remember this? And then eight biospherians were chosen to get locked in there. And in order to make sure they would get along, they put them on a boat called the Heraclitus that was a Chinese junk. And they sent them on a trip around the world so they would bond. And they did not bond. <laughs> four of them were scientists. Four of them were, I don't want to say cult members, but you know, and uh, new ages. And, uh, and when they got back, it was too late. They had to put them in there. So they put them in, and it was not amusing. But they, they, they toughed it out. And uh, toward the end of the project, they began to suffocate and starve. And I don't want to go into detail now. I could tell you later. But the bottom line of the story is basically, we don't know how to live on Mars. We don't understand how ecosystems work well enough to create a new one and put it on a spaceship and send it off. And what we didn't realize is that the ecosystem is not like an engineered system with broad tolerances that you can build 10 times as strong as necessary. The ecosystem is complex. And like most of nature, it doesn't have to stay the way you want it. It has alternate stable configurations. It can completely metamorphose itself into something else that it, if it could be happy, is perfectly happy with. And you are SOL. And that's what happened in Biosphere 2. So one of the other things we looked at in Biosphere 2, after they let the Biospherians out, we could use it as an experimental facility. And I would go in there every morning and lock myself in and lock myself out. But I did get to escape in the evening. Um, one of the curious things was the roaches and the ants really took off. And you could put your wetsuit down. There was an ocean. I worked in the ocean. You could put your wetsuit down and it would walk away if you gave it enough time. Um, so anyway, we, we went in there. And under the leadership of uh, of a couple of guys from Harvard, uh, from, uh, from Columbia, rather, we began to alter the chemistry of the ocean to make it resemble ocean chemistry in the pre-industrial era, which means lots of carbonate in the water, easy to build your skeleton, ocean chemistry in the year 2100. 
which means very little carbonate, acidic water, very hard to build your scale in. And we wanted to see if it would really have a deleterious effect. And what we discovered is two things. One, the growth rate of coral was depressed 40% uh, under the year 2100 scenario. But worse than that, under current conditions, it was already down 10%. And this is critical because if snail shells can't be strong enough, if coral can't be strong enough, it will be broken by waves, the shells will be crushed by predators like this titan triggerfish, which smashes coral to find the clams living inside, and this parrotfish biting chunks of coral in order to display its territory and eat algae in the coral. The, the corals would just crumble. The snail shells would no longer be able to defend themselves and the predators would get an edge over the prey, and it would kick off an oscillatory cycle that might end with the extinction of the prey. In order to measure this, we developed an assay in which we pretend we're a parrotfish, and we score the coral, and then we watch it heal. And we look at whether the coral heals as effectively as you turn the CO2 up. And this has now been done experimentally by Chris Langdon in, uh, at the University of Miami, and then Eric Mueller worked on our project in the Bahamas. We wanted to know if a marine protected area would enable the coral to grow more quickly by allowing parrotfish to become more abundant and scrape the algae that normally settles in new lesions. When the algae gets in there, the coral can't heal as quickly. If the water is acidic, the coral has an extra difficult time healing. And what we found was that if there are more parrotfish, the coral can heal more quickly even with the ocean being acidic. So global climate change is making life miserable for corals, but other things are also. Okay, so in summary, we have all these different things that are changing as the Earth's climate changes and impacting marine organisms on a global scale. But at the same time, we aren't making life any more pleasant on a local scale. We are going around destroying habitat, adding pollutants to the water, and overfishing. These are not things that require demonstration at the UN or running around with placards. This is stuff that can be corrected on a municipal or village level. So the real question is, if we were suddenly good guys and we did all this stuff, what effect would it have on our vulnerability to climate change? Well, before going into that, we have to acknowledge that there is some diversity of values in our society, and some of this is a bit problematical. In fisheries biology, even the scientists assume that all of the species that we draw from the sea to eat function independently. This is kind of a strange assumption for biologists who know damn well that's not true, but it allows us to make simple models to predict how many fish you can catch. And it's better to have something that works and is wrong than to have something that doesn't work at all. So the other problem with these models, and those of you following the fishery issues in New England now are very familiar with this, is that they assume the world is at equilibrium. That's ridiculous. The world is not at equilibrium. It, it, and really, to understand and predict anything, you need to know how things are changing, not how they're saying the same. So uh, there are problems with our approach to fisheries. And, and the reason we go ahead and do this is that the purpose of fisheries biology is very simple. It's to eat nature. And it serves that purpose fine with these simple models. Ecologists, on the other hand, assume that we actually can understand the whole thing, which is an equally dangerous assumption. And many of us, although in our work we try to be objective, we carry an implicit bias, a, 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 a cryptic value, that the purpose of all our work is to help preserve nature. And we don't find a lot of company in that endeavor. Finally. One of the driving philosophies of the world right now is capitalism, which is currently based on a model where growth is the greatest good, and there's no limit on growth. And the bias is that the purpose of nature is to be transformed into capital, leaving none to ensure that there's still nature there down the road. Now, these problems have been with us as long as there's been human society, and ancient uh, cultures have solved the problem. Of course, when there were many fewer people. Uh, my favorite articulation of the solution is from Fiji, where a citizen of a particular village is not said to belong to that village. 
That person belongs to the Vanua. The Vanua is the watershed, the ocean, and the village inseparable. They are not different things. They're part of a single system. So people got this a long, long time ago. The Fiji Islands have been settled for millennia. And this Vanua, which we're studying in northeast Fiji, consists of a rainforest called Nikurutumbu, a bunch of streams, each full of fishes that live nowhere else but in those streams. They're beautiful aquarium fishes. Lowlands that are there for agriculture, they're used for agriculture, mangrove swamps, and coral reef. Now, this same concept occurs in Hawaii, where it's called Hanawa. And the management system that makes the Vanawa or Hanawa sustainable is called a hupua'a, which means where the pig goes. And it's called that because Hawaii is a volcanic island, all the islands, and they have sharp ridges, and pigs aren't dumb. They don't like dragging their bellies over the ridges. So by where the pigs run around, that defines a watershed. And the Hawaiian kings would hold dominion over this pie slice going out to the ocean and including a piece of the sea and fishery rights. Now, in America, we call it a watershed. And instead of calling it upua'a, we call it human natural coupled systems. Or if you're of a different ilk, you might call it Gaia. The point is that this is a complex system. You need to perceive it as a whole, or you really can't do anything intelligent in it. And New England is no different than Fiji. We are part, sitting in this room, we're part of a Vanua that begins at the crest of Mount Washington and flows down through various rivers, through salt marshes to the sea. This is a wreck out in Stowagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, festooned with a gorgeous proliferation of invertebrates that are as colorful as any coral reef. OK, so we're in a Vanawa, and the question is, how is our Vanawa changing, and can we resist any of these changes? I want to show you a couple of cartoons that were created by Industrial Light and Magic. The point is that corals are ecosystem engineers. They build a lot of the habitat in the marine tropics, just as redwoods, kelp, uh, and other organisms are engineers that build habitats in the temperate zone. This is a dead staghorn coral. Can you guys see it? I don't know why we're not, un, unable to turn the lights down. But this is a dead staghorn coral. You can't quite make it out, but there's bacteria growing on it, kind of a slimy substance. The sand is bare, and there are just a few parrotfish. Now, the coral is the engineer of the system, and fishes and sea urchins are the carpenters and janitors. They keep it going. This is what. OK, yay, let's do our special effect here. Today, 50 years ago, this is not an exaggeration. There used to be grouper. There used to be many parrotfish. There used to be tons of sea urchins. They have venomous spines. We would curse them. There used to be large sharks. And most important, the reef was a dense framework, a jungle, of two species of branching corals, staghorn and elkhorn, Elkhorn, unlike any other coral in the world, up to five or six meter high trees, in stretching over areas as large as 10 football fields. This was an astounding habitat. And when I was a graduate student, I reveled in it. My whole generation of scientists lived in this habitat. It is gone. It is gone over a vast area, including the entire tropical West Atlantic. It's astounding. These two species of coral are now considered endangered. The sharks are endangered. The parrots are, par parrotfish are overfished. And the urchins were wiped out by a scourge that spread through the Caribbean in the mid-1980s and eliminated almost every last one. They're just beginning to come back. Here's why it mattered. Parrotfish eat algae. Sea urchins eat algae. The parrotfish were already overfished for 400 years. So their numbers were low. They were reduced to almost nothing by industrialized fishing, beginning after World War II. And then in 1982, a disease took out the urchins, the only last thing holding the corals alive by eating the algae that they compete with. So as a result, coral reefs are in precipitous decline everywhere. This is the curve for the Caribbean. This is the curve for the Great Barrier Reef. This is the curve for Indonesia with a little uptick at the end because those are the most resilient and robust coral reefs in the world. It looks like a recurrent theme. This is an event so profound 
that it marks the end of an epoch in the fossil record. We are no longer living in the Holocene. We are living in a new epoch called the Anthropocene. And this will leave an indelible mark on the fossil record as clear as the one that marks the asteroid impact that brought the end of the very large birds that we call dinosaurs. All right, as corals die, so does the world that they build. This is the Caribbean before the die off and after. Just seaweed and sponges. This is the mid-Pacific before a mass bleaching event and after. Not surprisingly, the fish eventually disappear. It's not just coral reefs that we're losing. This is a littoral forest made out of giant trees related to chocolate. This is a Caribbean bloodwood swamp that's protected in the lee of coral reefs. A seagrass bed and then perhaps the most diverse marine community on earth, the roots of a mangrove swamp. All of these habitats are codependent. So, in order to answer this question, does local effort help you restore a habitat and can it help you resist climate change? Colleagues and I set up a global observatory of study areas around the world in the tropics in Brazil, Belize, Panama, and Fiji. And we did the same thing in all these places. We set up conservation regimes, or we adopted ones already underway, and we monitored social, economic, governance, and ecological changes inside and outside of these areas. In addition, we asked, how can you measure the likelihood that your efforts will be effective versus dispersed across the ocean? And what we discovered over and over again is that the ocean is much less well connected one place to another than we'd thought. It turns out that baby fish really don't go very far most of the time, 10 to 100 kilometers, fish and corals. That's bad because if your reef dies, it's a cold day in hell before babies are going to come in from elsewhere. But if you keep it alive, the babies whose survival you enhance will come back. It's just absolutely critical. Now, one of the corollaries to this is that there were many more endemic species, species that only lived in one place than we thought. These are all fishes from the Indo-Pacific. These are their closest relatives in Fiji. They look different, and if you put them in a wearing blender and do genetics, well, usually we only do a fin clip, um, you find that they are as genetically distinct as any two very distant species. We found the same thing in Belize. And, and Brazil, and not only that, the species we discovered were things that we should have known about. This is the most abundant diurnal fish on the Mesoamerican barrier reef. It was undescribed. And the funny thing is, in order to see anything, you have to push them out of the way. This is the most conspicuous fish on the Mesoamerican barrier reef, undescribed. This is one of the most important food fishes in Brazil, had no name. This is a new invertebrate from Belize, that represents 10% of the global diversity of that important phylum. And this is a field of algae balls. And those algae balls may contain a carbon reservoir larger than that of the entire Amazon rainforest. I just did the calculation the other day, but I've been doing it over and over and over again because I just don't believe it. Another piece of evidence that fishes really don't go very far came from a study by Mark Hickson and his colleagues under our project in Hawaii. Now this is the big island of Hawaii, and these stars are areas called fish replenishment areas. The aquarium trade harvests thousands of these yellow tang. Isn't that pretty? That's a fish you buy to put in your aquarium so you don't have algae in your aquarium so your corals can survive. I mean, it's not like we don't know this stuff. And the question was, if you don't catch aquarium fish here, will they resupply the same island? And so, we use genetic fingerprinting to find parent offspring pairs. Okay, here, doesn't that look like Dory? Yeah. Dory's just a blue version of the same fish. Okay, so there's our little uh, Dory. What's her name? You know, the comedian. Yeah, that's, that's our Ellen DeGeneres there. And there goes her baby landing right there. And this is the, the statistical significance with which we can say, this is the child of that fish. In the open ocean, we could find the baby of a particular parent. That, I mean, we wouldn't have thought that possible before. Another baby landed there. 
This one came from there. That one went for a long ride, but still the same island. Okay, this is getting old. The point is that local conservation will lead to local resupply. It's worth doing. So, does this scale up? We looked at marine protected areas where no fishing is allowed in Fiji, in Belize, in Panama, and in Brazil, and in various ways compare the blue bars where no take is allowed for a certain number of years to the red bars that are areas that are fished, and this is the amount of fish biomass. Blue is usually higher than red. Duh, if you don't kill the fish, they are still there. <laughs> but it's not always true. You get these weird reversals in places, uh, like at Laughing Bird Key, there was no marine reserve effect. I didn't understand this until I finally sat out on Laughing Bird Key in Belize for a while, and it dawned on me that the protected area was actually only around the island. Nothing was enforced across the atoll, which is 20 times the size of the island. So it isn't working. If you make a park and you don't enforce it, it doesn't work. That may sound very, very simple and not worth $12.5 million to find out, but people don't realize how poorly enforced these parks are. Also, it matters where you put the park in the beginning. Half Moon shows a big reserve effect, but that's because it was very nice before they made it a park. That's why they made it a park. So you need to sort these things out to know how effective local conservation efforts are. In Brazil, where we have parks, and there is a difference between no-take areas and open access, a slight difference, the bars are higher here, more fish. If you go to deeper water where nobody's fishing, that's, that, there you finally see what will be possible if the parks were properly enforced. You would have five to 10 times as much fish. So this is an indication of the failure of the enforcement system of the Brazil Marine Reserves. So, fishing matters. What about pollution? This is an example of one of our study areas where we carefully tried to factor out the effect of being in, <coughs> in or out of a marine reserve, <coughs> which are these pur <coughs> sorry, purple areas, protected, unprotected. Uh, but how much of that is is masked by how close you are to shore, whether you're in the northern or the southern part of the reef, because naturally there's variation in the reef. Well, what we found is that, in combination with several other researchers working there, is that in Belize, you're actually ecologically in Honduras. This is a map of primary production in the ocean in the Gulf of Honduras. This shows you nitrogen pollution going into the sea from the farms in Honduras and Guatemala, and this shows you sediment flowing into the Caribbean from those places. And you see that most of the impact is from Guatemala and Honduras. But because of the way the currents work, whoops, yeah, because of the way the currents work, it's like a giant bathtub that is flushing into the southern end of the barrier reef. If you look at the distribution of coral disease that's associated with sewage, there's a huge peak right there. So a marine park there is not going to work because it is in a toilet bowl. And this is not something that people appreciated. Okay, so why are coral reefs disappearing? There's bleaching, acidification, intensified storms, rising sea level, and on a local scale, coastal pollution and overfishing. What can we do? Well, we can run around with the placards and reduce CO2 emissions, or we can stop overfishing and polluting. Now, it's very important to be as careful as we can in our personal lives as well, because that's the only way you can directly influence CO2 emissions on a day-by-day -day basis. But we must get our government to come aboard. All right, so the question is, if you really, really have to have intense enforcement, a lot of sacrifice, to resist global climate change effects by cleaning up your act. What evidence is there that that's really, really going to work? To find out, we went to the middle of the ocean. We went to the place where Amelia Earhart disappeared, the Phoenix Islands. And the Phoenix Islands are a group of atolls just south of the equator, almost dead center in the Pacific, where there are almost no people. There are 23 Ikiribas people, it's a nation of Kiribati, 
living on one of the islands, Canton, an old World War II battle site, and they're there to make sure nobody else takes over the islands. Otherwise, no people, no fishing, stuff like that. And this is what it looks like out there when you're seasick. All right, this is the nation of Kiribati. This is the Gilbert Islands, the Phoenix Islands, and the Line Islands. OK, this is a box the same size across North America. So Kiribati is at least as big as North America. But it's all water. If you put all the land in Kiribati in one place, I think it equals like Rhode Island or something. But their 200-mile limit is vast. And that's Australia, again, about the size of Kiribati. We went out there to compare the Line Islands in the north and the south and the Phoenix Islands for this reason. The northern Line Islands had a gradient of human impacts from Christmas Island to Kingman's Atoll. And so Enrique Sala and Jeremy Jackson and a few others from our team, Stuart Sandin, looked at the coral reefs where there were no people and where there were the most people and everything in between. And what they found was an even gradation. No people, lots of coral, and this pink stuff, coral and algae, tons of big sharks. Lots of small fish, but you don't see them. They're not dumb. As you go to the other end of the spectrum, very little coral, lots of seaweed, no fish. In the middle, lots of small fish, no sharks. So we thought, ah, we could make an index, like a coral health index that measured biomass of fish, amount of coral, and some other things I'll tell you about, and know where any reef in the world sits relative to its potential. The southern line islands were absolutely pristine. And the Phoenix Islands, something really awful happened there. The uh, parameters in the Coral Health Index, we call it chi, is kind of a joke, like the life force, you know, energy, all that, okay. Uh, fishes, fish biomass, very high where there are no people, very low where there are people. Coral cover, very high coral where there are no people, low where there are people. But here's the interesting one, microbes, very low where there are no people, and a huge concentration of pathogenic disease-causing microbes in seawater anywhere close to people. Not a surprise. But those same microbes kill coral and marine organisms. So in order to use this index, we developed a booklet to explain how to measure it. We developed a bunch of experimental assays. Here's that coral lesion assay. We look at how quickly corals heal. And then we pulled down the corals' genes. A group of five universities got together, led by BU, in a project called the Coral Whisperer, because we thought by using next generation sequencing and studying the genes turned on when a coral is exposed to a certain environment, we could let the coral tell us what it is annoyed about. And we could also measure the marginal benefit of local conservation efforts and global battling of climate change. Now, the Phoenix Islands protected areas was at one time the largest marine protected area in the world, almost as big as California, much bigger than New England. And that's the, Ser the vast Serengeti there. It's a World Heritage Site, and it's almost uninhabited. This is what it looked like before the mass bleaching event. This is a map, a heat map, of sea surface temperature as it stood for seven months with PIPA right in the hottest zone. PIPA is where El Nino begins. And in the year 2002, right after a successful expedition there describing a pristine system, there were seven degree heating months. That means for seven continuous months, the temperature was lethal to corals. And what happened was they died. We went out there to find out how coral regeneration proceeds under the most ideal circumstances. This was our benthic team, and this is our colleague from Kiribati, who didn't fit in the frame, so he's been photoshopped. And we measured coral recovery by laying transect lines and counting the coral that it crosses, a very well-recovered reef. It was completely stripped of coral seven years earlier. And we watched the fish. This is my transect line. And I'm trying to count these fish, which are very hard to count. They're the same color as the reef, and they're everywhere. <laughs> but the main discovery was that the real hero of this story is something called crustose coral and algae. It looks like pink paint. 
and baby corals love to settle on it. This is the only algae that can grow when parrotfish are grazing intensively, parrotfish and urchins. So by having the herbivores, it's like, it's like preparing the soil for corals instead of seaweed. So what happened out there? Well, live coral had gone down in the first few years. Crustos coral and algae had gone up. Algae went up a little bit. Rubble went up because of the destruction. But in the ensuing years, during the recovery phase, the coral came back. Coral and algae just skyrocketed. Algae were depressed as it was soft algae, as they were eaten by herbivores. Rubble stayed the same, which means no new coral died. That's reassuring. So, Phoenix Islands are rising from the ashes. They're aptly named. Here are the hordes of herbivorous parrotfish that are responsible for this feat. When the coral died, the herbivores did not leave. They provided a living shield to the reef to accelerate its recovery. If this were an occupied area, those herbivores would not be there. They would be on your dinner plate. They were everywhere, ranging from tiny surgeon fish to this four-foot-long behemoth parrotfish called a bumphead. Very rare in any inhabited area. And the coral is coming back. So in seven years alone, without local human influence, the reef is tremendously resilient. Now there were a few wrinkles. This is the, these are the islands with many people to few people. These are the islands that were pristine, and this is the amount of fish biomass. And these are the islands we were studying, and you could see that this island has a huge number of sharks. These don't. It's because a Korean vessel went through two years earlier and eliminated most of the large predators for, in a shark finning operation. Now what we found is that the amount of fish in a pristine site is almost half of a kilo per meter square. Can you imagine that? That's like being in the middle of a herd of elephants. That's what's supposed to be there. The Phoenix Islands in recovery phase are about half that. But you go down to familiar tourist sites like Fiji and Jamaica, look at those numbers. It's a ghost town. So the machinery of restoration is missing. It's missing because we ate it. So, so much for Fiji. What about New England? Well, two landmark laws command us, they give us the mandate to pull a Fiji in the U.S. In 2008, Massachusetts uh, promulgated the first Comprehensive Ocean Policy Act. Did you know that? Right here in Massachusetts. It says we must use, in essence, a Vanawa approach, a whole system approach to harmonize uses of the coastal ocean. In 2010, Obama signed an executive order bringing into uh, existence the National Ocean Council and ordering that we use marine spatial planning, all of our science combined, to make sure we get the best use of the ocean without diminishing its restorative capacity. This is Jane Lubchenco, a member of our ilk, one of my colleagues who is now head of NOAA and has the, the Republican crosshairs, uh, Sarah Palin's, what does she call it? a surveying instrument right, right over her. And there's been a violent reaction to this. This is a Republican blog, Obama's Ocean Policy Initiative, Washington's latest power grab. All right, so can coastal and marine spatial planning help us with climate adaptation? In Massachusetts, we're trying. We realize we have to have all the data in one place. We have to understand the processes that, that will enact change in the ecosystem. Focus on adaptation and consider the zoning of our coastal waters and experiment. See which zones work, which ones don't. And understand that realizing how things change is much more important than describing how they are at any moment. Boston University, the New England Aquarium, and the Gunn Center for Ecological Economics at the University of Vermont are working together with colleagues from California to create a computational science of coastal zone forecasting, like a weather system for shallow water marine ecosystems. And it's in it, we take GIS, you guys know GIS? It's just a map with lots and lots of data that you can overlay. That's the first step. And then we have this, we call this spaghetti and meatballs. This is a, a diagram of a computer model that links the economy in red to the ecology in green. And as the flowing between those two 
are the things people need from the ecosystem. When we learn how it works, we put it into a computer game that managers can use to determine whether they're investing their resources well. So the, the basic setup of the model is that it has a biosphere with all the biological stuff going on. It has an anthroposphere with our market and our culture and our values. And every time someone in this box wants something from this box, it takes something out of that box. And this is basically how the program is set up. And the question is, if you take more food, what happens to your recreation? If you, if you have more ships running around, what happens to the existence of the whales? These are called trade-offs. The manager can, can study these trade-offs by manipulating this computer game and see if life will get better or worse, or government will get better or worse, if you change aspects of governance, the market, or the ecology. This has been used in Belize very successfully. We're creating it now for Massachusetts. Okay, so one of the major issues, even once we know how to resist climate change, we know how to improve ecosystem health, one of the major issues is that the money, the little money that does go into this, is badly distributed. Up until recently, we put huge amounts of money into figuring out how threatened the ocean was and prioritizing what to do about it, and then a little bit into preserving parts of it, and almost nothing into adaptation and harmonizing our, our coexistence with the ocean. So it was a different philosophy. Count it and put a fence around it. What we need to do is certainly know what we're losing and prioritize what to do, but we need to put a lot more effort into getting along sustainably with the coast and with marine communities and adapting aggressively to climate change. So questions for you, for the people of the Vanua of Massachusetts. What do you value? Where are your priorities? How do I set the computer program? What trade-offs are acceptable to you? What should our natural environment, our seas and forests, look like? Do we want right whales in the system? You will have to have fewer lobster in the market. Do you want old growth forest on Mount Wachusett? Well, you won't have quite as many places to fall down the mountain on skis. And is the cod in the Massachusetts legislature truly sacred? If so, we have to abandon 20th century fisheries biology and leave cod that are really as big as this wooden sculpture swimming around in the sea to make more babies. We can do this. The law mandates that we do it. The science needs to be developed, and there needs to be constant, unremitting, unrelenting pressure from the constituency demanding that it happen. If we did all that, even if the reduction of CO2 emissions was painfully slow, as it's likely to be for the next few years, our quality of life would be better, and we'd be in a much better position to deal with the unavoidable impacts of climate change that have already been set in motion. Thank you.